All right, so listen, I want to open this session and, and welcome all of you to this dialogue, this Nobel Prize dialogue. And I have really been looking forward to this interaction. The topic is United by Science, and we're really going to focus on perhaps having a dialogue on what we need to make the most of science and scientists. And for this dialogue, we have with us a Nobel laureate, Professor Ben Faringa. And Ben, I want to welcome you to this session with our fellows. Thank you very much. My pleasure. It's great to be with you and with all the young stars. Ex exactly. This is the future. And so, Ben, I thought I'd start with you. Um, I'll put a question out there, but I want to make sure that we really, all of us, have a chance to participate and, sure. and have a discussion and even raise new questions. But my first question would be, Ben, in your mind, um, what do you think it takes to be a good scientist? I mean, you're someone we can all follow, so we want your advice. What's your view? Yeah, you know, it is it's difficult to say what exactly the roots should be because, you know, uh, let me let me briefly say what I when I was a kid, yeah, I grew up in a very remote area in the northeastern part of the Netherlands on the German border on a farm in a small village. And at that time, I don't think I did realize that I might become a good scientist, you know, which people say I am, uh, at least following a call from Stockholm, you know, this <laughs> magic call. But anyway, I think what is really, really important when I look back at my own career and when the early days when I was a kid or when I was a student, like most of the people that are in the audience here or are, we are discussing with, I think it was curiosity, being eager to learn and to get inspiration from Mother Nature or from all the questions, you know, you can think of or the beauty around you, you know. Uh, I was always, as a kid already, at a farm that is a lot to be discovered. Eh? You have the animals, you have the plants growing, you have uh, nature. And uh, I grew up in a large family of 10, we were with a family of 10 kids kids. Yeah, I was the second oldest one. So we were also greatly stimulating each other. So I think that is something I want to emphasize immediately at the start. You mentioned yeah, united as scientists. I was united as a kid already in a big family where we challenged each other. We were asking questions. We had a big playground together. And I think the most beautiful thing of being a scientist is to have a family a family of colleagues all around the world, being at young and old, yeah, junior and senior. And this is really absolutely fantastic that I go to China, I go to South America, I go to Africa, to, uh, to uh, the United States or England, and everywhere we meet scientists that share a common passion, a passion to learn and to discover. And I think this is one of the most beautiful things of being a scientist, to join this family. And when I just heard, let's have a WhatsApp group, please do so, because you can benefit from each other, from each other's experiences, yeah, to share information. And without any borders, yeah, enjoy that you are part of this big family that wants to go beyond the frontiers of current knowledge. Now, what makes a good scientist? As I mentioned already, it's difficult to say, but definitely the sense of wanting to know, to learn and to go a bit into unknown territory. Because what we want to do as scientists is not only thinking about things we know already, but in particularly about things, the questions, what we don't know. And that is, yeah, it is uh, a bit daring. Eh? It needs also to be a bit brave because you go in unknown territory. And often I tell you, you hit your head <laughs> because you don't know what you can expect. You can be in a completely dead alley. Yeah, and I had many of these experiences. But the beauty of science is that there are always these fantastic questions and sometimes these great discoveries are insights and that keeps us going. Now, you cannot be a good scientist if you don't have a basis, I think, a basic knowledge. So I always tell the students, yes, you have to learn, you have to get the basics, 
I'm a chemist and you have to get the basics in mathematics, physics, chemistry and biology to become a good chemist. And particularly, of course, in the fundamentals of chemistry. If you want to be like me, to be a synthetic chemist that builds molecules, you have to learn something about the basic principles of chemical reactivity itself. Otherwise, you will not get there. But this is a process. Eh? I teach undergraduate and graduate chemists up till today. My class starts next week. And every day when I teach, I learn something. Also from the students. Why? I don't only teach from the book, but I teach also from practical examples and new discoveries that are written in the literature. But then the students ask questions. And this is beautiful because they set me thinking. And then I have to study again and to learn. And this is this continuous process of learning and studying, yeah, which makes it so attractive and raises your level and become a good scientist. Now, I think there is a few other things. One is, of course, creativity. Yeah, Try to think a little bit out of the box. Try to think about what are important problems or important questions. And I think also two other things which are important, we can discuss further in this, in this hour. And that is the ethical aspects. I think it's really important that we have high standards. Yeah? You know the scientific process that you come up with good data. Yeah, of course, our explanation sometimes might fail because the new insights a year later might we have to change our mind about certain theories or explanation. But the data should be solid and the, and, and the science we do, we should have high ethical standards with respect to what we do, what kind of science you are doing and how we are going to use it and present it. So integrity and high ethical standards I think are crucial for scientists. Why? Because I want to emphasize all of the young stars here, they will be role models, role models for others in society. And this is an important and even more important than ever, I would say, in current society where we keep high standards and we act as role models, role models for knowledge, insight, and the truth, as far as we can tell from scientific insights and data. So I can see Santiago, you had your hand up. And so I'm not sure if you want to re respond to the topic of what makes a good scientist or ask a new question, but perhaps maybe you want to respond, Santiago. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Feringa is a first media. I am from Colombia. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I wanted to start with such topic. I see an interview that you made, in which you said that universities need to be playgrounds and I wanted to quote Carl Sagan when he says that uh, children have these questions like bubbles. They question yeah. everything. Why right. the grass is green? Why the moon is round? Everything. Why do we have those? But uh, we found that uh, the grown-ups think these like dumb questions. Why is the moon round? Well, because it's not a square. So. He said that every time that happens, we lose a science. <coughs> and also a problem that many high senior uh, learn facts, memorize the facts. So I wanted to ask you how we deal with this requirement to learn the fundamentals, but without failing into memorizing such facts. Yeah, this is a great question. Thank you so much. And this is where I struggle also my whole life, you know, and you will experience it yourself. Honestly, when you are a child, and I mentioned the example for me being a child in a big family on a farm, there is ample playground and, and discoveries and all these things. But when you go to school and especially to high school and universities and so, you have to go through all these steps of learning, doing exams, all these things. But I think to maintain this level of curiosity is really important. And you know what helps here is good teachers. I think all of you will remember one or two teachers that were really inspiring despite the fact, despite the fact that they, they stimulated you to learn the basics. They also, you know, set you thinking and, and stimulated this creativity. And when the little outside the box of the traditional books and whatever, 
And I think to maintain that is important. Of course, when I studied chemistry at the university, the first two years were rather a bit, I must admit, a bit dull because I had to do all these uh, classes and, and experimental courses, etc. Uh, the most int interesting parts were when something failed, for instance, in the lab, you know, and you got something completely different because then you ask yourself the question, what the hell is going on? And you learn from it. But I must say that I got really excited for chemistry in my third year, where we for the first time could do independent research, yeah, where we had projects and we could do something. And I will never forget the moment yeah, where my professor, who was an American, he said, because this was after three weeks and I had made my first new molecule. And he said, wow, Ben, you realize this molecule has never been made in America, not ne never been made in the world, not even in America. It was a totally useless molecule, but I was so extremely proud that I had discovered this, you know, and that was one of the moments that it's, he encouraged me and set the stage, you know, to my career of, of discovery. So yes, I would say in teaching, in studying, it's very important that we have a very good solid knowledge and we learn this because otherwise you get the problem that you are not able to discuss at a certain level, you know, because you miss a lot of information, etc. I mean, when you do mathematics, you have to be able to solve have basic equations. In chemistry, you have to know something about chemical reactivity or properties. The same with physics, you know, when you don't know anything about electricity or magnetism, it's difficult to make a device. But building in this ability to be creative, to discover yourself eh, in, in the practical courses. So that's a big, big advantage when you study, for instance, chemistry or physics or so, yeah, biology, you can do also all this hands-on type of thing. Uh, you can stimulate creati creativity of, in many ways, of course. Eh? I try to do this also in my classes, you know, when I give students articles and say, look, what do you think are the weak points in this article? How to ask questions? And what would you do different? Or how can we use this information to come up with a crazy idea? And uh, there, are, there are ways to do this. And, and, and it's, there is no one guideline, you know, but I agree that sometimes in schools and so, people focus too heavily on their exams and teaching, learning only for exams without forgetting that asking questions and creative, stimulating creative minds is extremely important for your future careers, eh? That's great, yeah. So, I mean, you're right, Ben, because it's almost like a musician when they learn how to play. They have to know right. what the notes are. And once they Absolutely. know the fundamentals, then they can start to be creative and kind of play with the boundaries of the instrument that they have. So that's I super. I fully agree. Maybe yes. I'll let Marcel, Marcel in. I don't know if you want to respond to the topic of what makes a good scientist uh, or ask a different question, but the floor is yours, Marcel. All right. Yeah, thank you. I will, will respond. My name is Mar good, good day, everyone. My name is Marcel Denny. I'm from Jamaica. I'm just following up on what it was said. I think since the face of child science is constantly changing with every new discovery and every new breakthrough on technological advancement, what it means to be a good scientist could also, uh, could also be constantly changing and improving. So with that being said, do you think it's harder to be a good science scientist now than it was like, let's say 30 years ago, where there weren't so many um, great achievements? Uh, I think this is an important question. I think but to say it's more difficult or different to become a good scientist now or in 30 years ago, I, I, I doubt it, you know, because uh, you have to realize that the pace of science it has gone quicker, you know, the, the pace of development and the whole package of, of discoveries and knowledge has, has almost exploded, you know, in the past decades. If you look around in the different disciplines, on the other hand, of course, also our ways to deal with information, you know, uh, the technologies that we have developed, you know, in, in for instance, natural science, etc. I, I think that gives you also the opportunity to, to uh, quicker handle all this information and data and so. I think the basis is still to uh, be able to select yeah, what is good and what is valuable. Uh, if you look at uh, how they developed science 30, 40, 50 years ago, or maybe 100 years ago, 
I think it was also really tough. If you look at the, the techniques, you know, there were no computers, of course. Eh? There were not, in my, my, my discipline, a lot of techniques were not available. Can you imagine that you cannot measure? You have, in, in, in chemistry, we use nuclear magnetic resonance or X-ray to see, to look at structures of molecules. That did not exist, you know, in those days. Still, they were able to determine what a sugar molecule is, yeah, or a steroid, an hormone in your body. I'm so extremely, I, I'm, I'm really, really, uh, so extremely impressed what people did more than a hundred years ago to elucidate, yeah, the basic features of the elements or the molecules. It was Emil Fischer, you know, more than 120 years ago, yeah, 130 years ago. Or so he elucidated the structure of all the basic sugars, yeah, the sugars in your body, the sugars in the plant, including the correct three-dimensional structure. This is still today extremely difficult, and he did it without any modern technology. I, when you read this paper, sometimes I advise you to go back in time and read some of these old papers, you know, of 50, 100 years ago. And it is really amazing how these scientists had to struggle and what they had to do to get correct answers. I'm really impressed, you know. Now often we, look, we, we make a crystal, we look to a, go to an X-ray machine, eh? and like taking an X-ray of your chest in the hospital, we make the X-ray of a molecule and we know the structure. Yeah? I'm not saying that it's always that easy, but we have a large collection of modern technologies that makes life also a bit easier. Eh? That does not say that the problems are not difficult, and the problems are as demanding as ever. But I would not say that it is more difficult or easy than it was 50 or 100 years ago, no. But to comfort you, the questions out there for all of you are as challenging and demanding and intriguing as they were for the colleagues 50 and 100 years ago. There are so many and there are new questions coming up every day. I have more questions than answers after a career of 30 years, I can tell you. Yeah, that. and probably one can say there's still a lot more about the world and the universe that we still don't know. So there's a lot oh. of questions that we still need to be addressing going oh, forward. Oh, I absolutely agree with you. And they, they are really intriguing questions. So many out there. And one thing I learned in my career, and that is modesty. I mean, as a scientist, you realize you, you, you make discoveries and even discoveries that others can use or recognize or that will be useful in the future. But when you look at Mother Nature and you look what we know and what we don't know, I think modesty is in its place. You need to be humble. Let me let you... You are, Ulysses, you are humble. You are humble yeah. and you will learn it during your career. Yeah. Let me let... Um, is it Ulysses in? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you all. Um, I am Ulysses from Honduras, and I just want to add a personal thought uh, related to the first questions. I think other of the qualities of a good scientist is the, a, a positive attitude to, to, towards failure. Uh, yeah. As students, uh, as students uh, you might agree with me, we encounter with failure too early in so many ways. And uh, I think uh, it's possible because Failure uh, often make us grow, and getting used to to failure uh, eventually make us better. Yeah. So, baby Ben, you can comment on that because at least in the experience of as long term scientists, is there's a lot of ups and a lot of downs, and sometimes there's oh, more yeah. downs than ups. So, what's your view on that? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I I agree with you. You know, people say always, "Oh, this science is beautiful. You make a discovery and whatever." But you don't make discoveries too many, you know. Of course, these beautiful moments, with these real Eureka moments, eh, you don't have them every day. The reality is that you work hard and you have to show perseverance. And I tell always people, if you want to become a scientist, yeah, you have to stand failures and disappointments. Because often you are in a dead alley or you are not simply not smart enough and I'm sure all the faces I see here, these are extremely smart people, yeah? Otherwise you would not be here, I'm sure you are. 
you are probably all more clever than I am. But I tell you, you know, you will also get your failures because there are so difficult questions and difficult problems. And of course, you might go to the left and the answer might be to the right. And we have seen this so many times. But don't don't get uh, distracted by that. Take take inspiration and a positive attitude from the small successes you get. And honestly, with a team of students that I have, we have small successes and we celebrate. Mm -hmm. And these steps bring science forward. And then sometimes you have a breakthrough. I tell you one example, if I'm allowed. I work on molecular motors and machines, but I work also on catalysis, you know? And these are the motors that keep the chemical reactions turning, like the enzymes in your body. We have been working on a specific carbon-carbon bond formation, which is the core of chemistry, eh? making carbon-carbon bonds to make molecules. And we worked on this for 20 years without any success. Can you imagine? 20 years, I had students working on it. Luckily, they had also other projects because otherwise that would be, and we always failed. And there were several students who came to my office and said, Ben, I don't want to work on this because it will never work. 20 years. And then one of my students made a mistake in the lab. And suddenly it worked, fantastic. And it took us a couple of weeks to figure out why it suddenly worked. And we could then, once you know it, we thought, wow, why didn't we do this 20 years ago? And then, you know, it went off and we had a lot of success in the past five years with these catalytic reactions, a big breakthrough. Sometimes you have to allow also failures, yeah? But please also don't all, only work in dead hands, eh? Also have something that gives you a little bit of safety. I always tell the young people, walk on two feet. One type of project that is very daring, yeah, with high risk, and also something that is a little bit more safe and gives you some progress. Maybe not big discovery, but small steps, but where you can make some progress and makes you very happy. So walk on two feet. That's great. That uh, keeps you running. You know, Ben, I have the exact same advice for the fellows in my lab. I always advise to have a high risk project and also have potentially a project that you're pretty certain that you can reasonably answer the question. So high risk and low risk. The other thing you mentioned a couple times in this dialogue is um, learning from uh, failed experiments or failures right. and trying to turn that around to a positive because it sounds like there's always something to learn and sometimes the failures are the greatest successes. So let me let Henrique in here. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Henrique Pinto and I'm a mechanical engineer student from Brazil. Uh, you talked about integrity and to have a good data that are truthful at the beginning. So I would like to ask, in your opinion, why do we have this strong spread of fake science nowadays, like fat earth and anti-vax people, and how could we avoid this? Uh, this is a really important question for society because we hear all these stories about fake scientists and people don't believe scientists anymore. We have seen this also in this whole discussions about uh, the COVID crisis. There was certainly a president of one of the leading countries of this world who thought uh, science, science was also an opinion. You remember who's, who this is? I don't want to pronounce the name. Uh, we have to be careful there. I think we as scientists have a duty yeah, to bring forward knowledge, insights, science, yeah, and that is the basis for our future society. And we all know that uh, when you are in academia, you know, or in research institutes or whatever, we have to come up with reliable science that can be in humanities, that can be in engineering, that can be in the physical science or the medical science, but base it on insights. That does not mean that we know all the data. Eh? This is what I often experience when I, I get an interview on television or radio or so, or for public, they often say to me, Dr. Fieringa, is it yes or no? Is it black or white? And I say, look, I know, yeah, that this temperature is 100 degrees and this ice is a solid and this drug yeah, works for 99% of the people. Yeah? But 
as scientists, you always have to be a bit careful because we don't know everything. It's based on the best data we have, the most reliable data that are reproducible. That's also important. But we don't know all the ins and outs because, you know, believe me, we all know Einstein's theory, yeah? Relativity. But do you think that is the ultimate word? I think in 100 years from now, there will be another Einstein who says, look, it might be slightly different, eh? the explanation. And you can explain the data maybe a little different. And we have seen this so often in science. So you have all of us have to be a bit careful and say, look, this is based on the data, the insights, the knowledge we have today. But I would say to the people when they ask you this question, yeah, about fake news and about the value of science, it's better to develop a drug, a vaccine, based on solid scientific knowledge. It's better to build an airplane, yeah, with an engineers that know how to, an aircraft should fly or how a motor functions, you know, because that is much more safer than doing it in, on, based on opinions, you know. And I had a very big debate with a journalist not so long ago, yeah, and she said also to me, ah, all this science, it's just an opinion. And then I asked her, do you have a smartphone? Oh, yes. I, I, see, I said, is this an opinion? <laughs> this is based on 70 years of solid fundamental research in chemistry, physics, engineering, and material science and device physics. So we have to bring the message forward, but we cannot deny it. <coughs> <laughs> that some people, you know, it's difficult to convince. Right. And I mean, we also have to understand that science is also evolving. And so new facts will sometimes, right. you know, yeah. change the way we look at a problem as we get uh, more information. Absolutely. And so I think that's our responsibility to help educate society that as we learn more, we have to adjust our, our views on different aspects um, right. as well. So Black and white, eh? Right. Uh, it's not black and white. And people now, I, you have this whole vaccine discussion with this COVID crisis. I, every time I try to explain, look, this is not based on what we did today or in the past year. This is based on 30, 40 years of research in mRNA, how to deliver drugs, what vaccines do to viruses, etc. We developed the H, anti-AIDS compounds. We developed vaccines against SARS, etc. It's not based on a few months of research. This is a history of decades of research by scientists. That does not mean that we know everything about vaccines and that there cannot be side effects, but better base it on this solid science. And we have to explain that. It's our duty. Eh? That's right. That's our responsibility as well. We have our responsibility mm -hmm. to bring that message forward. So Lydia, maybe I'll let you in. Do you want to comment on this or do you have a, a new question? We're basically on the same theme. Every one of us has been talking about what it takes to be a good science. But Lydia, we'll let you in here. So, distinguished participants, it is a great pleasure that I participate in a, in a round the table in this magnificent event. I read in your biography that you, when you won your Nobel, uh, you said back in Stockholm that now is going to put science in the map and that you'd be your priority. Well, yeah. these are difficult times in Brazil. I also read about the creation of the Ben Feringa Fund, which aims yeah. to increase public interest in science, starting with a science quiz, right. and a visit to secondary schools. Bernard, my question is, Brazil, you have new elections next year. What kind of solution proposal for science or education could the new governance adopt that would cause a positive domino effect on our science? Yeah. In a country with so many problems. I'm not in politics, eh? let me say that. And you, uh, you had uh, this clear uh, you, you talked about science, the role of science in society, especially, you know, for the democracy and so, and for the future. And also you talked about my feeling and so, and how to, to outreach, if I understand it correctly, because I could not understand everything, but you also mentioned outreach and, and the feeling of funding. Eh? Yeah. So I, I think you should realize 
that when we educate, and in my opinion, this is the most important, at every level, when we educate young people properly with an open mind to think, to be critical, yeah, to be able to think about, yeah, but how does society work? Yeah, in, in, in all disciplines, eh? from humanities to, to te technology, social science, whatever, what are, yeah, this, what can science and knowledge contribute to solve key problems or advance your society? And I think children should already at an early age be confronted with, at their level, of course, with this whole idea of that knowledge yeah, can advance yeah, the way we do things, insights. Yeah? And for politicians especially, and this week I will have a meeting with captains of industry and politicians. And one of the phrases I will use, yeah, knowledge is power. And politicians, and especially also higher ranked people, they are very interested in power. Also in Brazil, I know that. You're referring now to your president probably. Knowledge is power and it will become more important in the future. Those people that have insight and knowledge and can distinguish between all this information we get these days, what is valuable and how are you going to use this for the benefit of society, for the benefit of your country, for the benefit of your people, being it economically, being it society, so social, being it for technology, I think that will be uh, at the top. Don't, don't misunderstand. I think insights, knowledge, yeah, is, is so important for the future, you know. And uh, I would uh, uh, really emphasize that uh, put, your, put your money in education, yeah, and educate young people with an open mind to confront them, you know, with the, what we know, what we are going to know, what will be the developments of the future and have a critical attitude. So don't believe everything you find on the internet, but how are you selecting information that is really valuable and useful and bring that also forward to the society. Uh, I would say when I had to advise a government, make sure that you, your education from the early age till your university education at all levels, try to, to build a very good education system, you know, not by dictating, yeah, but giving solid basis at every level and then train the students at every level to have an open mind and be creative, but in particular also to be critical, you know, yeah. Now, I, I, I can say something about how, how we go to the to schools and so, so I, uh, after in Stockholm, they asked me, the journalist, what are you going to do, Dr. Fieringha, after you got this beautiful prize? And I said, look, I'm a scientist. I have a passion for science and I want to continue with doing that. And I also like teaching. So I'm, I'm teaching students classes and we have a research group, of course. But I also told them, I want to go to society, to schools, to bring the message of knowledge, learning and science forward. And so what I do is, I regularly go to schools, mostly high schools, but sometimes elementary schools. We invite also uh, students, uh, uh, high school students and so to the university, of course, to confront them with research, to have discussions with them. We do experiments with them. And this foundation that I set up is meant to have, for instance, we have public science quizzes, so that all the public can participate. Uh, all disciplines are covered. So we have teams of young stars in different disciplines that uh, are in a panel then. We have somebody from television that guides the whole quiz. It's broadcasted also on local television. And we go to schools with teams of students to, uh, as you said, mainly we go now, we focus on schools that are in less developed regions, that have less contact with universities or higher education to encourage the students you know, and discuss with them and maybe do also experiments with them and so to stimulate their creativity. So this is, this is mainly what we are trying to do.
So the idea there was knowledge is power. And I think you emphasized again the fundamental building blocks that a good education can give. And yes. I think what I heard in there was also this idea of lifelong learning, which you talked about right from the very beginning. If I'm allowed, I can you tell you one really great experience from two years ago is what just before the COVID lockdown, when I was in a gymnasium, a high school eh, in the Netherlands, in the middle of the country, and I gave a talk, what I usually do, I give a talk, you know, for the, in this case, it was for the 400 uh, students aged 15 to 18 years old. So pre-university high school. And uh, the teachers were there, the students, a big class. And usually I give a talk of 45 minutes and then we have an hour long discussion like we have now. But after 10 minutes, one of the girls, a 15 year old girl raised her hand and she said, Professor Feringa, it must be great that you got the Nobel Prize in Stockholm because you never have to make an exam anymore. You never have to study anymore. And of course, everybody started laughing, eh? all the kids. And then I said, look, I just bought the latest cell biology book that my first year students use in their classes. Yeah, First year cell biology, 1200 pages, American book. And I'm studying now since a couple of weeks, like a first year student, because we have a strong cooperation now with the medical school where I have to understand the language to be able to speak with these guys. <laughs> and that means that I have to learn basic cell biology, which have different terminologies from chemistry or engineering. And it's fantastic. And in the break, you know, many of the students came to me and said, professor, professor, you were joking. No, you don't have to study. I said, study, you have to do the rest of your life. Exams is only one small part of it, but you have to learn the rest of your life. And this makes life exciting. You learn new things all the time. Absolutely. Um, all right, let me let San Sanjeli in. Yes, thank you, Antonelli. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, well, I wanted to ask uh, a question about, um, first of all, I, I'm very related to what you said about the seek for truth and the, the importance of education in general. And perhaps this is the reason why I have a background in cosmology, but then I switched to high energy physics because I want to understand um, the behavior of, of the universe in a fundamental level. But then, um, there's also um, the fact that mentioned that Henrique mentioned about the problem with society that this uh, skepticism, weird skepticism against science, right? So it is um, it is the responsibility of scientists to fight against this. I wanted to know your advice for a young scientist that perhaps is interested in scientific policies, that wants to get involved in policies, <laughs> but has a PhD that has a prospect in science. So, and you know, the academia is not very generous to people who are interested in politics in general. So I wanted to know your advice about what would be your advice for a young scientist interested uh, in getting involved in, in no, I, general. You know, honestly, uh, I'm not in politics, eh? Uh, so uh, I, I'm maybe not the right person to say so, but when I talk with politicians or with people in the government or in all kinds of organizations, I think what strikes me often is the lack of knowledge. And so I would give you a strong advice. Yes, you can make a difference. When you go into politics at whatever level, you know, I, there you have also a passion. And I know politics is different from become, being a, 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 a phys, you are a physics, uh, you study physics, you know, yeah? elementary particle physics is different job than being a politician, you know, where you have to deal with societal problems. But on the other hand, when you are a particle physics, yeah, you have to learn your basic knowledge, facts, formula, insights, etc., to interpret data, to know what is true, what, what is something that is meaningful. And I think when you go into politics, I would advise, you have a big advantage that when you study at the university and you get this kind of training, first of all, you have a knowledge about facts and insights not only about particle physics, but in general about what science does, you know, what science and education mean. Go to ask the questions about, hey, what does this information really mean? And you have the ability, due to your training, 
to go to the real data and information and see is it valuable, yes or no. And the other important part is that you learned how to have a critical attitude. So you are able to ask questions because the most important thing about science and education is to ask questions, no? So I think also in politics, it's really important to ask the right questions. And so I would advise, take this as a solid fundament, yeah? Your education, the fact that you can have a critical attitude and that you can interpret data or information you receive in a solid manner, yeah? And say, oh, this, this person says this and this, but what are the real facts? And what is yeah, the content of this? Because I see too many cases where I see a lot of talking without content, yeah? And I would say it is more and more important that if you want to be in the lead, yeah? that it is about quality of information, yeah? And not only about the process, yeah? You see what I mean? About the process or the wording, but what does it really mean? What is the quality of information that you get? And what is the real insights to discuss a problem to get to a solution? And this holds also for politics, yes? But as a scientist, we really can make a great impact. And in many, right. many countries, you're evaluated not only on your scientific contributions, but also your educational commitment, you know, your role as a teacher and educator, and also how you impact society. How do you reach out to society? And one way to do that is by interacting with policymakers and helping them to have informed policies rather than policies that are baseless. You know, and so we have a great role as scientists to be able to work together with policymakers. Um, yeah. Maybe I can let, is it uh, Dominique? Uh, let Dominique? me emphasize, oh, I please. cannot agree more. Informed policies and reach out. And I think there we can do more. And I hope the younger generation is trained to do this better than we did that in the past. Because I was never trained actually to reach out. I like to go to the public and to discuss with students. But please take it as part of your education, you know, because this is more than ever important role that we go out and to to discuss with the public with respect, eh? because people have different opinions. But you can you you are trained to have a critical attitude and to provide the information. Well, Learn. another yeah, another way to look at it is that many of us are funded by the taxpayers. So it's our yes. obligation to communicate back to the people who Absolutely. actually provide the funding for us to be able yeah. to do what we do. Yeah, and we should do that. Yeah, it's our duty. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dominicia, right, welcome to the dialogue. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. It's really an honor. Uh, I'm Dominica. I'm from Ecuador. So I wanted to bring up... Um, issue that has been out there for a couple of years now regarding um, discrimination in the scientific community. So as a woman and as a Latin woman, I have been read uh, some articles and some uh, people that have faced these kind of issues in the scientific community, especially women and minor ethnicity. So uh, I just wanted to ask you, like, as an upcoming generation of scientists, how do you think we can manage to overcome this issue to include more uh, minor uh, ethnicities and well, in, in our case, women to, to be more out there and to be recognized? Uh, I know that there have been an awesome a scientific woman a, out there, but I think that this is an issue that we still have to work on the following year. So what would be your advice for us? Well, this brings in a new topic of the importance of diversity. Um, and yeah. really having inclusion and allowing many different perspectives, experiences around the table, basically. And so yeah. um, obviously you brought up the example of representation of women, but obviously there's you know, regional you know, and ethnic issues to think about. Um, so maybe Ben, you could comment on your views there. Yeah, I think this is a really important topic and I'm really glad that you brought it up, Dominica, because uh, it depends on, of course, but it plays a role everywhere, you know? I cannot deny that. But honestly, uh, I have a very open mind because I think we should, we should stimulate every talent, irrespective of background, color, gender, whatever, yeah? And it's easy to say when you live in a wealthy country like the Netherlands, you know, but uh, I know there is different cultural situations where also 
the division, you know, the social division between yeah, gender groups, you know, is completely different, you know, for religious reasons or for whatever, political reasons. Uh, in Holland, where I live, we have a very open society, I must say, but that does not say that we have not issues, you know, where also gender issues and diversity is still high on the agenda. In my group, I always have been extremely glad that I had a really very diverse group yeah, of young and, uh, uh, people in my team. Uh, I have currently in my group people from 14 different countries, you know, and 40% uh, of the, the scientists, young scientists, so the students, uh, PhD researchers in my group are women. So I have a, a, a very diverse, and I'm extremely glad with that. Because I, I don't don't care, you know, what, what gender or what background. Uh, I, I want to stimulate talent and to help them on the next step in their career. And I think that is our duty uh, as teachers. But I know it's it's not everywhere the case uh, in, in all situations. So I'm always trying to make a strong argument. Please, please teachers, please managers, you are there not for yourself. You are there for the young people to help them in the next steps in their career. And of course, for the more senior people, sometimes it might be difficult to change. But for the young people at the start of your careers, it should be obvious, you know, that it should not make a difference, that everybody should get equal chances, you know. Yeah. And and I, for me, that is a no-go. I think it's so important, you know, that uh, that, that, that that we do, do, do this. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think if, if, if you're running a research lab and you hire 10 people that all have the same training and same education and same background, they will probably miss 90% of the solutions because they'll only look at right. it from one perspective. Right. And right. so a very, very smart research leader, it's like a coach of a football team. You know, you don't only want to have goalies, right? You want to have field players and you want to have people that can run fast. You want to have a really diverse talent pool. And I think if you're running a research team, it's probably a, a great strategy for winning a, a, a successful, uh, you know, yeah. a successful team. Yeah, yeah. I, I have, I have over the years. It's really important that you mention this uh, connection to uh, to a football team. You know, yeah. the diversity of talents. Yeah. And my team, you know, there are people with a background. Although the core of our work is chemistry, yeah. The, we have people in, with a background in, in physics, in engineering, but in particular also biology. But let me emphasize once again, you might ask, oh, do you only go for the people that have uh, the highest marks? No, I go for particular talents, you know. So for research, for instance, when I have certain projects in research, I look also, you know, for people that are very creative, yeah? or have a special talent, you know, to do things a bit different. Yeah? And so I try to have this diversity in my team. And also I have subgroups. So I, I, I have a large group, but I have sub teams. So I have a motor team and I have a bio team. And in this team, young bachelor students, master students, PhD students and postdoc researchers work together and they operate as a team. Although they have their own projects, they, they stimulate each other, boys and girls, people from all kinds of countries. And it's really, really beautiful to see how they stimulate each other. And when they have different experience and backgrounds, where they did, for instance, undergraduate studies or their cultural backgrounds, how they stimulate each other, what questions they ask, new insights. Yeah, it's, we learn from each other and it's absolutely beautiful, yeah? And as a bonus, yeah, my Indian students organize an Indian evening, yeah, or my Spanish students or Italian students come with a, uh, say, okay, let's have a meal together and we will cook. And they experience also the cultures of each other's. I have now a Mexican student, you know, which brings a different flavor. And he brought me, I can show it you in a moment, he brought me a fantastic sombrero, which I will... Uh, we are at my next party with my group, you know. So it's not only that bringing the science forward, but it's also the diversity, yeah, of different people that come together to build the team. As you said, you know, the talent pool, yeah. And there are many talents. 
And science is not only learning about books or doing experiments. It's also the way you think, the way you stimulate each other. And that gets back to the idea of the creativity as well. So Alicia, right. I'll let Alicia in. I don't know if you want to comment on this point about team building, diversity, or if you have a new point you want to bring up. Uh, hello, thank you. I'm Alicia Delfino from Argentina. Um, uh, I, will, I wanted to ask about uh, uh, your teaching experience. And you mentioned previously uh, your deep interest in promoting talent development and, right. and promoting uh, the, the interest of new students in science. So um, many of us um, may be teachers, and in my case, I'm, I'm starting my teaching experience. So um, my question was, um, from your experience, uh, what advice can you give us to to promote interest and engagement of new young students yeah. in science research. Yeah, that is, uh, I mean, there is no one guideline, I think, to be a good teacher, you know, and to teach to students and to make them. And, but I think there are a few things that, at least for me, work out. First of all, be enthusiastic. If you are not passionate or enthusiastic about the topic you teach, how can you expect that your pupils are getting enthusiastic? Second, make it a bit attractive in the sense that don't only talk about basic principles and, and uh, you know, you have to teach that. You have to teach the basics, you have to teach. Sometimes it's a bit dull eh, when you teach mathematical formulas. But I'm always impressed how teachers can bring in examples, yeah, uh, questions to the students, discuss with them, come with problems for chemistry, physics, materials, biology, medical. It's also interesting to bring real, real life problems, you know? I sometimes bring a newspaper and say, did you see this in the newspaper? Or did you see this on Twitter? Yeah? To give examples, to touch upon things that are, uh, is experienced in real life, yeah? And, and, and that makes it more attractive to put teaching in perspective. And also take the questions of students serious, yeah? Because that, that gets them engaged. Uh, I always, I always like when the students ask questions that I have no answer, and then I have to say, "So now I have to go back to the books and to to study tonight, and I will come with the answer tomorrow when I give the new class." Uh, this discussion with students, the engagement, but uh, in particularly also to make it possible for students to feel why it's important to learn something, you know, like a formula or like an, a theory or so. Eh? Because not everything will be useful immediately for the topic you are studying or for your job later. But then realize when I studied, I also followed classes. And I say this sometimes to my students in chemistry. Eh? When I followed, I, I followed classes at the university, I followed a course in ancient Egyptian architecture and painting, so hieroglyphs. It was absolutely fantastic. It gives you completely different mindset, yeah? But I also followed some classes in economics because we had a fantastic professor in economics, a famous guy, and he was so funny, you know, he was telling about, because economics can also be a bit dull, eh? But he was so inspiring, telling stories about bank crashes, about, you know, all kinds of things that I never had realized. So sometimes it's also good to take advantage of examples a bit outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. So I have a question just for the whole group. How many of you in the group are teachers or educators in any capacity? So I, I am. But how many of you guys raise your hands? More than 50 percent, you know, so that's a pretty high number. I mean, mo you know, just as we're students, we're all educators and teachers. So I think uh, great points there, Ben. Yeah, and, and honestly, I must say, one of the best schools I ever had when I was, I mentioned when I was a third year chemist, yeah, in my undergraduate studies, and I had to give classes for students. Now I can tell you, when you have to teach yourself, and I think many of you have this experience now, you really have to be on top of your topic, you know, that means you have to, to know what you are going to tell, because students immediately detect failures and they have tough questions for you. 
So this was for me an eye opener, you know, and I loved it. I love to go and see, oh, how can, how can I make it attractive? Can I come with examples that students will find maybe more exciting than what is in the book? And, and there is so much to find. And luckily you can find a lot also on the internet and, and, and there is a lot of, of information that you can use in your classes, provided that you are critical about what you are going to use, eh? is it value, etc. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, I mean, also with all these animations, with these movies, with things that you can do to make it more attractive, that didn't exist when I started, I can tell you. Now you see this fantastic, I mean, you can walk into a living cell to explain biology. Isn't it fantastic? Right. That, that, that makes it attractive for kids, you know? Absolutely. Okay, Santiago. I would say that uh, even if you tell those the Faringa that you are not in politics, you are because you are in applications. You are in the applications of the future. And if so, you are going to modify what we are going to consider to be in the applications, for example, in the medical engineer that you have mentioned in your yeah. investigation. Also, I wanted to uh, ask you, what do you believe are the responsibility of the future scientists? As an example, not just in the uh, collaboration in research, publications, working for industries or teaching. Mm, I wanted to mention also, because I see that the interaction is some limited. Uh, for example, the programs that seek to increase the number of entrepreneurs and academics, especially in communities that don't have the resources like money or institutions. So new, to name a few, at least from my field, I'm an electrical engineer and a PhD candidate. Uh, ITP is my village, ITP for a billion, mid sober among others. What are your thoughts on responsibilities on such topics? Of course, I'm in the natural sciences, you know. So I'm in chemistry, yeah, we do chemistry, and we work together with physics, with biology, with the medical people, etc. And so, yes, we patent, for instance, we patent uh, all kinds of things because we think it is valuable and especially in our cooperation with industry because we have also application, uh, sorry, programs together with industry. But also some of my students <clears throat> uh, are engaged in startup companies. So I, I think we should not underestimate how many opportunities there are. Of course, when you do at the university, you want to learn, you want to study, you want to do science to advance, maybe do, be involved in the team to do discoveries. But there is also great opportunities to be entrepreneurs. Now, in my opinion, but okay, uh, this is my personal opinion. If your own go only goal is to become a millionaire and to become rich, I don't know if that's the best driving force. I thought it's may maybe um, better to see if you can find something that might set you on the stage to become an entrepreneur and to make something to practical applications for the benefit of society of to come up with solutions that can help other people. And if you then can make a lot of money, that's great yeah, for you. Yeah? But, but my drive is also towards my young students. If we have something that is interesting yeah, in chemistry, yeah, material science, can we bring it forward yeah, to society so that people can benefit from it? Yes. So yeah, I think so that's an important aspect as well, the innovation. And, and um, yeah. you, you know, in some ways, if you have the basic research, if you don't have that, there's nothing to innovate. So you really need basic research. But the innovation component is also, uh, I think, one of the responsibilities of a scientist, whether you innovate it or perhaps somebody else uses what you've discovered is, is always a good thing. Listen, I think we need to move on. So we're going to move over to Miguel. And we've got a few other folks that have not had an opportunity to participate. And I want to make sure everybody can get sure. into the dialogue today. So Miguel, uh, go ahead. Okay, Dr. Ben, nice to meet you. My name is Miguel Alejandro Diaz. I'm a PhD student in the area of computational chemistry at the Venezuelan Institute for Scientific Research. I want chemistry is a science with endless application for sustainable development. Today, Chemists can design new, mm, efficient, and environmentally friendly synthetic strategies for getting new materials. So, what's your vision as synthetic chemists of the goals of synthetic chemistry for the next decades? Would you like synthesis to be addressed for, in order to get 
material for, sustain for sustainable development. Green chemistry should be the new standard in every lab worldwide. That's oh. all. Okay, that's a pretty specific question about your views about synthetic chemistry. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm a synthetic chemist, you know, and of course, I'm deeply involved in this. And to give you an idea, in the Netherlands, uh, my colleague and, my, and myself, uh, we established a center for sustainable chemistry. And we started with that now six years ago. And this involves major multinational companies like Shell, Axel Nobel, yeah, BASF, the biggest chemical company in the world. And the government, Ministry of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Science and Education, our National Science Foundation, and a couple of universities, you know. And we established university hubs where we attracted young, talented scientists. And we have built facilities there where also industry can participate. And this is all focused. This is a 10-year program, yeah, with a budget of 11 million a year or so at the moment. 70 young PhD students are involved at the moment. And we build this to get joint academic industrial cooperation to advance sustainable chemistry. It's entirely focused on sustainable chemistry. So low energy, low waste, recycling, new materials, etc. So for instance, to give you an example, recently we had several patents together with Axel Nobel because we developed from wood, yeah, and I'm not talking about the wood in the Amazon area, but <laughs> waste wood yeah, that you normally burn to make it into a building block that replaces acrylate. You all know acrylate paint, acrylate coatings for your car, for your house. And so we made now a new polymer, a new plastic that is as good as an acrylate coating for your car. And this wow. is on waste wood. And this is typically what is done in this center. So to give you an impression, Yes, we have tried to develop with our students the green chemistry of the future. That's and great. I think we have a crucial role there to build sustainable processes and products. This is really important. How are we going to do things in the future? <laughs> Who's next on the list? So we have, um, is it Dominique? Hello, everyone. My name is Dominique Mombru. I'm from Uruguay, and I would like to ask another question similar to Miguel's one, but, sure. but it's more generic. How do you envision the future of science in the coming decades? What topics and areas do you think that will be relevant? And could you please give me some examples? Yeah, that's a very tough question you asked me, lady. <laughs> because how, how it's, I, let me say one quote, you know? Yeah? It's not easy to predict the future, eh? Right. It's better to invent the future. And this is what scientists do. And this is what you will do as young stars. You will invent and make the future. Not, it's, it's, more, it's more easy than predicting the future. It's not easy, but... Uh, it almost gets back to what you said in the beginning about find out what you're passionate about and then yeah, follow yeah. that. And yeah. perhaps then through that passion, you might invent a whole new field. And so yeah, yeah. You, should, but, you should follow your passions. Yeah, but honestly, you know, of course, Science is so broad, there are so many aspects, so many areas where you can work. And if you are in the area of medicine, yeah, we all know that we have now all kinds of treatment for cancer, although we are far from solving the problem. But think about dementia, the elder people, you know, that lose their brain function. <coughs> Excuse me. We have hardly any idea how to treat that. So to talk about something, you know, the elderly people. Talking about sustainable chemistry are, are fuels, energy carriers. It's nice that we have solar panels and windmills, yeah? But to have a, a, a plane, an airplane, if I want to fly to Uruguay or to Brazil or to South America, we need an airplane. I can, by ship, it will take me too long. <laughs> so to fly a plane in the future. So we have to take, do something about, there is big discoveries to be made for sustainable Eh? future. When we think about society, to have everybody inclusive, yeah, to get proper education for all our young people, yeah, to 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 uh, treat poverty in the world. I think there are many many problems that is, is, uh, how to call it, science will take the lead in the decades to come, and there are many challenges for all of us, yeah, in many many different 
is the plans. That's right. Okay, and then Ig Ignacio? Yeah, Ignacio here. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ignacio Vasquez, my chemistry student from Chile. And well, I, I have some questions. Um, well, considering the technological difference between Latin America and all the top science regions like Europe or North America, um, how much do you think that the country where you did science helped you to win the novel? Do you believe that if you were working in Latin America, for example, at, at that time, you could have achieved the same? I am asking since I want to know how you think we can work together towards uh, right. science that is, that is not biased to the country of origin as a, a really united science. It's a tough what question to ask have? them because you can't do the control experiment. <laughs> yeah. So, and also, yeah. what will be the, the role for us young scientists to... Yeah. I, I think issue. yeah, I think this is a really great question and a really tough one. Let me emphasize once again, yeah. Talent has no borders. I mean, don't think that in countries like America the kids are smarter than in South America or in China or in the Netherlands. Yeah. The talents are everywhere. I mean, you are very talented, and so talent has no borders. So Nobel Prizes can come in South America, in China, in Europe, in America. I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm very convinced of that. Of course, I have to say there is a difference, yeah, because when you go to certain countries, the level of science and in the institutes suffers, you know, from eh, the way the educational system works, or the government spends on to education or on science or the quality of the research institutes at the universities, etc. I fully realize that. On the other hand, I think there are many programs where people can exchange, go to different co countries to get, to, to exchange information, to get experience, etc. And I think we should stimulate that, especially from people, young people from countries, you know, where the opportunities are maybe not as good as when you study in Harvard or in Stanford or in Cambridge. Um, and I think that is the beauty of being in, in the academic world and in, in, uh, in science that we stimulate. We have many programs, you know, to exchange students. So I always have students yeah, on an exchange for a couple of months, also from South America, also from African countries. And I think this is really important yeah, to stimulate young talent. I had the opportunity also to go to the UK when I was a young boy, or to go to some uh, some uh, meetings in America, you know, to some symposia and so to meet other students and to have an idea of what is going on in these in these institutes. I think that is an advantage of being in the academic world. And if you are properly stimulated, and I think the governments should spend money on those programs, especially in Europe, we have these programs like Marie Curie programs. Mm -hmm. Students can exchange and work in different institutes different universities. And I think this is extremely valuable. Yeah. So right, that, not, that brings up the idea of diversity. About the opportunities you get. Right. Okay. We're going to have to maybe move to a little bit of a lightning rod be, uh, round because we still have a few more people that I want to make sure we get in. So we have Robert that I think you're next on my list here. Hello. Uh, I'm Robert Mamani from Bolivia. I have two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, when you were working in, in synthesis and stereochemistry, you were thinking, I'm going to work in molecular uh, machines. Like, how came that idea? Yeah. And second, um, <clears throat> how to deal with frustration in research? Because many times when you are doing a PhD, you have like only four or five years. Like, it's not a long margin to fail. No. Thank you. No, I, I tell you, you know, starting with the last question, of course, I mentioned before, you have to stand frustration, things go wrong, yeah? But also, it's important that you have topics, yeah, that you have also escapes, yeah? That you have opportunities to uh, do it a bit different. And that your supervisor also builds in, yeah? Or when you're doing research, you build up a program that you build during your PhD, also some mm -hmm. security you have, yeah, you are part of a larger program where there are opportunities to get results, etc. Yeah, 
uh, I, I think that is important, you know, to keep a certain balance in the research you are doing so that you, you cannot work for four years on a PhD, only be frustrated by negative results. That's not good. But I, when I was a PhD student, because you might think that everything in my life goes well, when I was a PhD student, I had eight months during my PhD that every single experiment I did failed. Eight months, yeah? I worked harder and harder, you know, to the level that my mother said when I came back home in the weekend, she said, do you eat properly? Because you look so terrible, you know? But I was working and I was so frustrated. And then I got a wise advice, go one week with your friends on holiday. And so we went for one week to Germany. We had a great time, had a good beer, yeah, a German beer. And when I came back, suddenly every experiment worked. So sometimes it's also good to make a step back and go play soccer, you know, football, or go out with your friends and you see life from a different perspective. You know, I mean, I think that's great advice because I sometimes get my absolute best ideas when I'm out on a run or doing something completely yeah, great. different. Absolutely. Where, you know, your brain relaxes and you actually think, of, you're still processing the problem, but you right. really are in a different environment. And sometimes that helps you look at it with fresh eyes. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna move on to, is it Taina? Uh, my name is Taina, I'm from Brazil. I'm the center state of Brazil, it's the south border of Amazon forest. Um, first, I wish to thank this opportunity because uh, when I was a child, I wouldn't if, even think that this, what we are doing about now is possible. I would never think that this would be possible and I'm really grateful. Um, but my, my question is a, is a bit tough. Here in Brazil in the year of 2017, the percent of GDP invested uh, in research was 0.5%, while uh, there the, for the same year in Netherlands was 0.67%. But the, the difference is huge while the it's like 6 billion euros there and 1.7 billion euros here. Yeah. Um, but, but this is not the end. Due to several political and economic crises, I guess the broader region, but especially Brazil is facing since 2013, the amount of federal investment is decreasing year by year. For example, today the the federal financial support eligible for a full-time researcher of undergraduate level is about uh, 550 reais per month, which means by the current current exchange, it's 86 hours per month. Yeah. And for a graduated student, 1,500 reais or 234 euros, and for a, a doctor's level, two. 2,200 reais, which is kind of 343 euros. I, I just said a lot of bunch yeah, of numbers. Yeah. So you're really but, concerned about the funding, uh, national funding for research and how one can be competitive um, based yeah. on that. Do you think that uh, the, the funding is essential for having a such long-term high-level research because yeah. we can endure, endure short-term research with almost no funding. Mm -hmm. But yeah. while we, we make long-term research, how can we endure 30, yeah. 30 years of research uh, without yeah. funding? Right, that's uh, a really yeah, you know, yeah. great, great question. I, I may answer, you know, I cannot look into the budgets of the Brazilian government and I'm not in the politics here. <laughs> So who am I? But honestly, it looks to me that something needs to be done and that the uh, uh, academic world should bring this message forward, you know, that, as I mentioned before, educating and training young people, that's your future. And knowledge, science, that's your future. I mean, you have fantastic nature, the Amazon, you know, all these things, absolutely beautiful. But the most important in your country is the young talents like you. That will bring the country forward in any discipline. And the government should realize that investing in these young talents, yeah, by confronting them 
with the borders, the frontiers of science, that will bring the knowledge and ultimately the power to your country and the future. And I, I think if I see a figure like 0.5% in research, that is ridiculously low, if I might know. Yeah? Because you need, you need a certain basic budget to advance the science and to give the young people the opportunity yeah, to work at a certain level yeah, and to make an impact and to be trained. Because the training of all of you depends upon yeah, if there's sufficient investment yeah, in science, in education. And then the, 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 the remark that you say uh, about uh, you are very grateful that it's possible that we meet each other. That's where you started. I'm extremely grateful that I meet all of you because I cannot travel to South America now due to this Corona business, etc. And it would be impossible also to travel to all those countries where you are from. But look, what science brought us, yeah? Science brought us the technology in front of me that we can see each other, we can speak to each other live, yeah? Via internet, we can discuss with each other. So, yes, I'm also grateful for the possibility to see all of you and to discuss with you. That's right, so, that's a great comment. And based on the backgrounds everybody has, it's a real diverse mix of people. All of right, course. so folks, we have time for just a few more questions. And I know there's three people that haven't had a chance to get in. So I, I wanna let Zymina Zy in, then I have Jose and I have Eduardo. So we, we probably have to be a little more concise in our questions and our, our responses, but go ahead, Zymina. Hi, I'm Jimena from Mexico, and I'm really excited to meet you all. And my question, well, you mentioned ethics before, a strong ethic uh, um, uh, labor and everything. So my question is, uh, how do we determine our responsibilities as scientists? Is a researcher responsible for the uses that others have for their discoveries? Okay. Good question. Now, yeah. yeah, that's a very good question, of course. I mean, our goal is to advance the science, yeah? But of course, you should also be careful that we have an open discussion at the universities, particularly with our students, with our colleagues, about what we do and what we don't do. You know, think about DNA technology, yeah, where you can gene, change the genome of the human body. In principle now, the Nobel Prize was given for CRISPR-Cas technology last year, you know. So we can now, at a very early stage in the cells of an embryo, change the DNA, yeah, to make maybe a perfect human being in the future, whatever that is. This is an ethical discussion that we should have, especially at the universities, also with the students and also with society. Because yes, science brings opportunities, yeah, in medicine, in, in law, in whatever discipline, yeah, which has ethical consequences. But I think it's our duty to think about that, to discuss that openly. Yeah, we cannot expect that, that everybody does that, but in the universities, we have a duty to do that. Yeah. And that really comes back to this outreach and our responsibility right. to help educate the public around us. Right. All right, I'm gonna let Jose in. Finally, my turn. I am Leonardo from Argentina. Um, I am biological chemistry. Um, I have two questions for the moment uh, about the responsibility of scientists. I have recently participated in the course of dual use of knowledge. And I want to know uh, what do you think about the responsibility that scientists have for the knowledge that we acquire? A kind question of, for all. Yeah, that kind of is related what, to the last question about the yeah, ethics. Yeah. What do you think are the responsibility of scientists with society? Uh, with emphasize uh, the importance of knowing the regulation of our countries about chemical weapons and precursors yeah. of illicit substances, etc. Yeah, no, you know now by now that I, I think we have a very strong responsibility. The ethic standards, you know, that we should have, we should train our students in, uh, in this. And, uh, and of course, uh, regarding uh, possible yeah, misuse, we should make the public aware of that. Like for instance, chemical weapons or whatever. And if, if I would be approached by a government, you know, do you want to work on chemical weapons or do you want to work on toxic substances or something that can be used for the weapon industry? I would refuse to do that 
And I don't want to have my students be confronted with that. But of course, in other cases, it's not so easy to say no, because there it might be life-saving eh, when you think about medicine or so. So that, that is a kind of discussion that we should have open, open-minded open discussion at the universities. But once again, we have ethical standards and we should keep the standards very high. And we, have, we are role, role models for our society. And the university has a special task there with our students to train them and to be absolutely yeah, clear in what we can do and what we cannot do. That's a really good point. I'm going to let Eduardo in. You're back up. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, as I was saying uh, before, uh, it has to do with something that uh, it was mentioned earlier uh, with Marcel and Ulysses. Uh, they mentioned that uh, we have, and by now we have great achievements in, in knowledge. Uh, certainly we know more things now than a hundred years ago. But uh, do you think serendipity still, play, it still plays an important role in, in science development? Yes, sir. Serendipity is really important in, in science because you, as I said before, you go into certain directions, you have ideas, you have plans, you have theories, but then suddenly it is totally wrong. And by accident, do you discover something that makes a real difference or puts it in a different perspective? So yes, serendipity yeah, makes, makes, uh, is, is, is important in science. That doesn't mean that you are only guided by serendipity. You have to think about what you know about theories, about making plans and whatever. Yeah, if you would develop drugs or you would have medical tools only by serendipity, I, 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 it would give you a hard time. Eh? But you, you want to base it on, on rationale. And, and if we develop methods for new chemicals or me methodology for industry, yes, you have to rationalize. But even there, and I mentioned you this case where we worked for 20 years on a project without any yeah, rational advance. And then suddenly we made a mistake yeah? And serendipitously, we discovered a breakthrough. So yes, I, I agree. This is important. We should, we should not uh, out fence everything in. Leave, leave possibilities open to be very creative and to wander into different directions. Yeah, Because the garden of science and knowledge, the paradise, is beautiful and has many undiscovered areas mm -hmm. where serendipity can find something really beautiful. You know, that's a really good point. There's so many examples of Nobel prizes that have been awarded for what is perceived to be a mistake. And I think sometimes, right. sometimes the difference between a Nobel laureate and everybody else is the Nobel laureate learns from the mistake and it really <laughs> turns it into something. And they, they, they right. are, they're, they're not deterred. They don't take the experiment and throw it in the garbage. They go, what no, can no. I learn from this? Yeah, and it's yeah. almost then where the real breakthroughs are coming. Yeah, this is just if I can give this example. Mm -hmm. Good question. This is how we discovered our molecular motor. Yeah. We were working on switches, you know, like the switches in your eye for information storage. And a switch, you know that from a light switch or switch on your laptop, it has to switch back and forth. But suddenly it did not switch back and it switched forward. So can you imagine instead of going backward, it went forward? And when we realized that, we discovered a rotary motor. And that was the basis for my Nobel Prize winning discovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're getting close to the end of our time together. And this has been a really, really stimulating discussion, a great dialogue. You know, we started with the simple question of what does it take to be a good scientist? And we went all the way from, you know, education, we went to policy making, we went to research ethics, uh, we went to um, celebrating every success, no matter how big or small, and not fretting over the failures. So I think this was a really great, great journey. And my hope here is that many of you will continue to stay in contact because this was a real unique opportunity to bring you all together. And Ben, I actually want to just kind of turn back to you and I'll let you have kind of the final world word before I um, give my thanks to everybody. Uh, we, uh, let, me, let me be very brief then. I think, yeah, value your talent and take advantage of that. Yeah, because you are all 
very talented, yeah? And don't think everything is known or has been discovered, yeah? You, of course, you build on scientists, yeah? Scholars before you, I also do. But you are all so talented, yeah? And please, please follow your dreams. That's my main message. Follow your passion and your dreams. Oh, that's a great way. That's a great way to um, kind of have the final wor word. And uh, again, I want to thank all of you for your participation. This is again, something we've been really waiting forward, looking forward to. Um, in some ways, because of the COVID crisis, we've been able to do things in new and creative ways. And as Ben said, we would never have been able to create this kind of dynamic environment where we could all come together like this and, and learn from each other. Because as Ben says, you never stop learning and you never stop teaching. So with that, I want to thank you all and um, you know, look forward to more of our interactions going forward. So thanks again for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much and a lot of success to everybody. Bye-bye.